Acts 13 is where we are. Acts 13. And I just wrote a little on the board to get us started. Acts 13, the title that we're given in my outline here today is Prayer, the Beginning of the Mission. So when we look at Acts 13, the first three verses, we're going to see uh, that they prayed before sending Paul and Barnabas out on this mission from Antioch. Now, Antioch became a, a great church, a strong church located at a, a strategic location. They could send people out, you know, into other parts of the world from there. Um, let's start by reading, if someone would, Luke 10, and I have verses 1 and 2, but if you'll read Luke 10, verses 1 through 3, and then drop down, and I think verse 9. So Luke 10, 1 through 3, and then verse 9. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among the wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. Heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Verse 9, the kingdom of God. Now, the purpose of them going out and them sending them out two by two was to confirm the fact that the kingdom was near. Jesus preached that the kingdom was near. Uh, John the Baptist preached that. He's sending these out two by two to preach that same message that the kingdom is near. And then in the book of Acts, we find the kingdom is here. You know, it's established. Now, why did Jesus tell them to pray first in Luke 10, 1 and 2? There's a specific reason. He says, therefore, what's the therefore part? The laborers are what? Yeah. So he tells them to pray first. Of course, there can be other reasons. The laborers are few. And then verse 3, doesn't it say something about lambs? among wolves. That's why I thought we, we would include verse 3. Uh, don't you feel that way sometimes when, uh, in regards to the church? You know, the church is the bride of Christ. And when we read and study, the more we learn about the church, we learn how beautiful this bride of Christ is. And God's eternal purpose was to establish this church. So all of us, all mankind, would have an opportunity uh, to be saved. So he tells them to pray because the workers are few, there's a lot to do, and you are lambs among wolves. And I do feel that way sometimes. You know, when you watch the news of it, Bonnie kind of referenced in his prayer, uh, there's a lot of hatred in this country. Uh, and one group stirring up another group, you know, so... I won't go political on the class, but uh, we all have our views about that, and hopefully we're tuned in enough to, as as Christians to try to just be a good example and do what we should uh, to encourage others. A lot of that will improve if some of those people uh, that are burning down buildings and even murder and what have you, if they became Christians, uh, well, that changes their approach to life, doesn't it? Okay, Acts 13, let's start verses 1 through 3. And you notice that we have an emphasis on prayer. Uh, the first uh, Sunday that I met with you, Eddie introduced this class, and I remember commenting that I do feel like that's, that's an area I really need to grow in. And I've been working on that, so to speak, for quite some time. And, you know, the more you study and the more you uh, want to know God, well, you improve. But I don't know anyone that I talk to that feels like they have arrived in that area where they pray as often as they should, as well as they should. 
You know, I can tell you that I have a hard time finding the words in prayer. Uh, I do a little better in private prayer because if I struggle, it's just between me and God. When I'm called on to lead public prayer or class prayer, uh, I really struggle with the words. And uh, I hope I'm getting better at it. I remember as a young Christian, you know, being asked to uh, lead a prayer. And I did. But, you know, men are a lot of men, not everybody. A lot of us, when, especially when you're first asked to lead a prayer, are very nervous because we do struggle in a setting like this to find the right words. Any comments on prayer before we start reading here? You may not lead a good prayer, but you're a really good teacher. Well, <laughs> <they> make it. <laughs> Well, I was talking to you about, I, you know, appreciate song leaders. I played singing, but I shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, it was in Littlefield, you know, and a small congregation, you, people do what they can. And what you, you may not feel comfortable, you just do it. I, I've never done it here, and I don't plan on it because we have people that know how they can lead singing really well. They pitch the song really well. You know, I could tell sometimes when I'd be singing, I, I don't think I pitched that very well. I mean, everybody's going every which direction. So, anyhow, we do appreciate the different abilities that people have. Uh, and, and whatever that ability is that, that a person has is important in the body of Christ. Uh, never minimize the cook, you know, someone that prepares a dish. And, uh, to take to someone else or whatever the occasion might be. And sometimes that's behind the scenes and they're not given a pat on the back, so to speak, as much as maybe uh, preachers and some others are. We appreciate the, the preacher and everybody, uh, the elders, deacons, everyone that serves. But prayer, we need to work on our prayer. And in my outline, I'm given seven, several verses for us to look at as we get to them. But let's start reading through chapter 13. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, so prophets and teachers at Antioch. Now these prophets and teachers and people that had other gifts, uh, keep in mind that the first century, you know, they couldn't go get a convenient little book like that with the whole New Testament in it. And then, of course, you can get the complete Bible. They didn't have it all. They had the Old Testament but they didn't have all of the New Testament written down. So they have uh, teachers and prophets, and then the word comes a little bit at a time, it's written down, and other uh, prophets are given the ability to teach. And so in this, uh, in this church, we have Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed, and the word prayed or prayer is, is the primary focus of today's lesson. Uh, it's not the only focus. We want to see other points as we read through this chapter 13. On this schedule, we have chapter 13 for today and next Lord's Day we have chapter 14 and that's Paul's and Barnabas their first missionary journey then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them they sent them away uh, so they fasted and prayed before this journey started and then they sent them away but they laid hands on them now turn over to chapter 14 and I think it's verse 26 at the end of the mission. Verse 26. From there they sailed to Antioch. They're coming back to Antioch. For chapter 13, they leave Antioch. They're set apart for this, for this missionary journey. Now they make the journey and they're coming back to Antioch. From there they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. So in chapter 13, we see they laid their hands on them and sent them away. That was for the purpose of commending them. The church at Antioch commissioned them, commended them uh, to for this missionary journey. And then they sent them away. 
So there was a, a way to, you know, in a public manner, they laid their they laid their hands on them, they prayed for them, and sent them away. Now, in today's lesson, uh, in the outline, we have a little bit about this idea of laying their hands on them, and uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in establishing the church. Uh, there are different functions, and in Acts chapter two, we see that those that obeyed the gospel. Uh, they were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins and received what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. So they have the indwelling of the Spirit. Now that's for Christians throughout time, from Acts, from the first century in Acts chapter 2 to right now. When someone is baptized into Christ, they receive this gift. They receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but the empowering of the Holy Spirit from the laying on of the apostles' hands that was a different function. Uh, I don't know if you could say one function of the Holy Spirit is more important than the other, but when we look at the empowering of the Holy Spirit we're on the day of Pentecost, the apostles were empowered to uh, speak the word of God. They could speak all these languages. They got the attention of the people, and they were promised. Jesus, Jesus promised them, we, and we've done this before. We went back into the book of John, and we saw, you know, Jesus said, if I go away, I'm going to send the Spirit to guide you. And they were to be guided by the Spirit into all truth. They were empowered with the Holy Spirit to preach and teach, to heal, to, for, to perform miracles and such as that. And it was to confirm the Word of God. And then for the first part of the book of Acts, the first five chapters or so, we see the apostles were empowered with the Spirit. And then eventually, I think it's Acts chapter 6, when the seven deacons were selected, and the apostles laid their hands on them. And right off, we see that Stephen, if you'll turn back over there, Stephen in Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Back up to verse 6 of, uh, not Acts 8, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verse 6. Whom they set before the apostles, that's the, the deacons, and when they had prayed, and there's the importance of praying again, when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And then verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Now jump back to verse 6 again. Chapter 6, verse 6. Uh, the ability for Stephen to perform these wonders and signs was after uh, the, the Spirit chose. The Holy Spirit chose through the laying on of the apostles' hands to give Stephen uh, this ability to perform these great signs, which he did. And he gained an audience, and of course we know what happened. Uh, Stephen was very powerful in his preaching and teaching. And then uh, what did what happened to Stephen with the approval of Saul? Stone to death, wasn't it? Stone to death. Now keep in mind, chapter 6, verse 6, they laid their hands on them after they prayed. So prayer, the beginning of the mission in Acts chapter 13... Uh, prayer uh, was was before they laid their hands on them, and and then the Holy Spirit imparted these gifts to uh, maybe all of these seven men. But we know for sure that the Spirit gave this uh, these gifts uh, to perform miracles and such to Stephen. Now turn over to chapter eight. Philip is another of those seven uh, uh, deacons. Chapter eight. Now, let's see. Let's start in about verse 5. Well, verse 2. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial. Now verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And then verse 8. Great joy. We covered this a little bit last time. Uh, verse 12. Now chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, both men and women were baptized. And then verse 14, 
Now the church is being established in Samaria. People are obeying the gospel. They are becoming Christians in Samaria. Then verse 14 of chapter 8. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, how did they receive it? Well, verse 12. They believed the preaching. They were baptized. They were obedient to the faith. So when they received the word, Jerusalem sent Peter and John to them, two apostles, right? Who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet, now look at these words, he, the Holy Spirit, had fallen, uh, I, I read it wrong, let's back up verse 16, for as yet, he had fallen uh, upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, let's spend just a little time there. They had been <clears throat> baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, Acts 2, in regard to the Spirit, what happened when they were baptized into Christ? They received what? The indwelling. So we see here in this verse the indwelling of the Spirit and we see the empowerment of the Spirit. Verse 16 <clears throat> For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. That's the empowering of the Spirit. So why do we have the empowering of the Spirit when really it's, it's those that believe and are baptized for remission of sins that we receive the gift of the Spirit? Well the empowering of the Spirit again is to confirm the word and to preach the word until, uh, you know, it is complete about the end of the first century. Then, verse 17. So it, sa it says in verse 16, uh, the Holy Spirit had not fallen upon any of them. Now, they had been baptized for the remission of sins, and they received the indwelling. But then, verse 17, then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Uh, verse 14. Who is it that laid hands on them? The apostles. the apostles. Peter and John. Peter and John. And then read a little further. Let's see what Simon acknowledges here. Verse 18. Still in chapter 8. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. Now, the indwelling was when they were baptized into Christ, wasn't it? But this power, went, now look, and we can tell very clearly that this is empowering because Simon, uh, he saw that, uh, that he could receive this, possibly. Now, he doesn't get this ability. Now, Simon says in verse 19, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. Verse 22, he was told to repent and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Uh, doesn't it tell us back earlier that he practiced sorcery? Verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people. Now, see, we can see how his motive was wrong. He said, I'll give you this money. You give me this ability. He thought, man, I can really impress people. That sorcery <coughs> that I used to practice, uh, it's nothing compared to what he saw with the laying on of the apostles' hands. But uh, Simon saw that it was through the laying on of the apostles' hands that uh, people received this ability. You see, Philip could not pass this on. Philip had the ability to perform those miracles. Back in Acts 6, when the apostles laid hands on Peter and the Holy Spirit uh, gave Philip that ability, but Simon recognizes that it took the apostles to pass it on through the laying on of hands. Any comments? Questions? Now, I, I'm just, I'm going to get off this fairly quickly because uh, Sean has, in, I think it's week eight when we get to Acts 19, 
to cover these topics a little bit more. The empowerment of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit, and the laying on of the apostles' hands, that kind of thing he plans to cover more in week eight. But while we're here, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Now, uh, all of the verses before that are connected, but for sake of time, if someone will read 1 Corinthians 12, 11, then we'll read Hebrews 2, 4. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. <clears throat> <laughs> All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. And he gives those gifts as who determines? As the spirit determines. And then he brings those various gifts. If you read before that, he talked about various gifts of the spirit. Uh, Hebrews 2, verse 4. God also testifies to you if I find wonders and various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Distributed according to whose will? The Spirit, according to God's will. According to the Spirit's will, these gifts were distributed. So you see Simon's era, uh, it, well, he was motivated by pride. Something we all have to guard for most of us, I suppose, have to guard against his pride. He was motivated. He wanted that ability to do it to impress people. But the Spirit gave it to those whom the Spirit will to have it. So, And he chose to do it through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Uh, but the Spirit is the one that, that gave those gifts. Okay. Let's go back to Acts 13 now. And now, if y'all, at any time, well, uh, let me say this about this. That's a big topic, topic I just brought up. Uh, that's a very deep topic to me that I just brought up. Uh, because, you know, when you get with your friends and all, uh, you, you will hear people say, well, or maybe you don't hear it as much as you used to, but probably still hear it. But I'm waiting for, for uh, God to send me a message. I'm waiting for the Spirit uh, to work on me, to make me a Christian. Well, that comes from not understanding that topic that I just presented briefly. And uh, I, I, I don't want to spend the whole class on it because we want to focus more on prayer. But I want to encourage each and every one of us as we read through the book of Acts to think about how the Spirit established the church in Acts chapters 1 and 2, and how the Spirit indwells us, then how the Spirit empowered others in the first century, how the Spirit worked through the laying on of the apostles' hands, and, and those things. And once we can uh, kind of separate that out, uh, the book of Acts and the Bible just makes more sense to us. So think about that as you read through Acts. And as we work up to chapter 19, we'll, and we'll uh, cover that topic again. What I do want this, it's in the lesson here. Uh, Acts 19, verse 6. Just a little bit more about this empire. Acts 19, 6. Uh, one reason I thought to go ahead and use some of these verses that are in the outline today because if we get, wait till we get to Acts chapter 19 and try to gain understanding on this topic, I think it's more difficult to get all in one lesson. But if I introduce it a little bit today and then you keep those things in mind as you read through it and study on your own the book of Acts, then these things will make more sense. Now, in Acts chapter 19, uh, it, this happens in Ephesus 19.1. Uh, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Now, as we read through this, now it may be easier for some than others. I think this is very deep 
It is for me, okay? It takes work, spiritual work, to discern this. So they said to him again in verse 2, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, in Christ. You know, we won't go back to this, but there's a lot more to connect right here. In Luke 10, 1 through 3, and then verse 9, he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom in verse 9. To confirm the fact, and, and if you read through the Gospels, you see that word kingdom. That was one of the favorite subjects of Jesus, of our Lord, when he uh, preached and taught on this earth, the kingdom. You know, it's nearly here, he says. And then in Acts 2, uh, the, the preacher says, it is here. Verse 5 of chapter 19. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, in other words, their baptism was important. Paul makes it important to these people at Ephesus. Verse 6, and when Paul had laid hands on them, this is after they were baptized, so he laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. You see both topics here that we're talking about. They were baptized, just like the people on the day of Pentecost, uh, and just like Acts 22, 16, to have their sins washed away by the blood of Christ. And then Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And then verse 7 says, This was now the men were about 12 in all. And then verse 8, again, come back to verse 9 here the kingdom, the importance of this kingdom. Verse 8 in 19, chapter 19, verse 8. And he went into the synagogue. Y'all remember us focusing on that last time? It's just a habit. It's a regular pattern for Paul and the other apostles. They find a synagogue that's, uh, uh, you know, to go into when the people are assembled so they can preach Christ to them. And he went into the synagogue, verse 8, and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of what? The kingdom of God. So they preach Christ. They preach the kingdom of God. They preach remission of sins and on and on the list can go. It's the good news. It's the gospel that they are preaching. But I guess uh, what I'm trying to focus on here without going off track too much is the fact that the spirit worked in the establishment of the church. It worked in the preaching by the apostles. Uh, it worked in various ways. And when we study this, you know, you might, might enter your mind, well, which of these is more important? Uh, my understanding right now in my mind that you can't say one is more important than the other. It's the way the Spirit worked. It's the way God had planned in order to establish the church. But I do understand this. When I was baptized into Christ, I received the gift of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit. These other things when the word was accomplished, when it was fulfilled, when we had all of the word, these other things would diminish, would go away, wouldn't they? But for 2,000 years, anyone that hears the gospel preach and obeys the gospel, they can receive exactly what we have as Christians. Now, comments, questions? I'm either going to have to raise this up or sit back down. <laughs> you so can, can raise it up. See, I'd raise it, yeah. Well, I'll sit down a little bit. Comments are welcome, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, concerning prayer, I want to uh, use some of these passages that have been provided in the guide here, and of course, get some participation here if you choose to. Paul in prayer. Paul understood God's power at work through prayer. We pointed that out even in the scriptures that we just read about how they prayed before doing certain things, before laying hands on them. In Acts 13, 1 through 3, before sending Paul and Barnabas out. Who else went with Paul and Barnabas, by the way? John Mark, wasn't it? 
Uh, to me, now we may not get to talk much about John Mark today, but I really like that topic. John Mark went with them on this missionary journey of Acts 13 and 14. And then he departed from them and went went back, went back to Antioch. Uh, and uh, Paul, later, when they go on the second missionary journey, Paul doesn't want to take John Mark. Now, this was not a doctrinal issue. Barnabas wanted to take them. This was just a personal issue. Paul says, well, he left us before. I don't think he's mature enough to go. Let's leave him here. Barnabas said, no, I want to take him and give him another chance. Uh, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm thankful for more than one chance in life at some things, okay? And Barnabas, what was what was he called? Uh, what was the word that we think of with Barnabas? Encouragement. He knew how to encourage others. He encouraged Paul in a big way. He's the one that made Paul acceptable to the church. Uh, and then he supported, wasn't John Mark Barnabas' Barnabas cousin? And he supported John Mark. He said, no, I want to thank John Mark. So Paul went one way, Barnabas went another way, and they just converted more people. So it worked out really well. But uh, I like it. I like thinking about John Mark. And then who wrote the gospel of Mark? John Mark. So uh, he's very effective. And he did grow. And he did become very strong in the faith. Okay, Philippians 1, 19. I'm going to ask that y'all uh, participate here and read as I give you these scriptures. If someone would find Philippians 1, 19, and then someone else, Romans 15, 30. Romans 1, 19. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Philippians 1, What did I say? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Philippians. I do that all the time. I'm glad y'all are paying attention. They have in, in school, I still teach math. I tell my class, now when I write the wrong thing, some when I say one thing and write something else, you tell me. So they do. Appreciate it. <laughs> Philippians 1, 19, someone. For well, I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. And he says, I know. You know, he has confidence in prayer. I know that through your prayers, the Spirit will do this and that. Now, I think I'll just try to do this. I'll pause occasionally. If you have comments, please speak up if you have something to say, okay? Um, Romans 15, 30. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. And this translation says to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Strive. You know, I I don't I don't speak Greek or anything, but uh, that word strive, it may have the uh, implication of what I was telling you earlier that, that I just sometimes I just really have a hard time finding the words that I want to use in prayer. You know, and uh, so it is something you have to work at. You strive on it. You know, and it takes a lot of effort on my part. Sometimes I have things on my mind that are easy to pray for. You know, it's easy to pray that God uh, be with Kathy, my wife, in this chemo treatment. That's not hard. But when I think of my brothers and sisters in Christ and all of their needs and, and the fact that we are tempted in this world, and, and I do in my mind uh, when I pray, I, I do pray. It's been a blessing to have brothers and sisters in Christ for the last, I don't know how many years now. And some, I don't even know their name. I just see them occasionally. Uh, and it's encouraging. When you see someone you know is a Christian at the grocery store, uh, does it kind of give you a boost? It does me. You know, I think, well, there's a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ. And, you know, we're all in the same boat. We want to encourage others. and We want to be an example. And if you know other Christians around, you think a little bit about how you act and what you say and your walk with God. Any comments? 
<clears throat> Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. And then if someone else wants to find Colossians 4, 2 through 4. Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. <clears throat> And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always be keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. For which I am ambassador, an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now notice the words praying, prayer, supplication. Pray for the saints, all the saints. Pray for Paul. Pray for the preacher to find the right words. Uh, and to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel. To declare it boldly. Uh, what did, well, we know what that means. Mine says fearlessly. Fearlessly, boldly, fearlessly. Boldly, uh, not arrogantly, but with love. Uh, you know, I, I find that sometimes I wonder if I if I said it in a wrong way because sometimes you get a chance to say something to someone and you're I don't know I've done this more than once. I think okay now I don't I don't want to be offensive, and then you say something as as lovingly as you know how and they're offended. So uh, it's not easy to know uh, exactly how or what to say to people, but we need to find a way to say something like the word fearlessly and boldly to declare it, to proclaim it. Comments? He says, as I ought to speak. Colossians 4, 2 through 4. <clears throat> Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, or chime in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And this one says, make it clear, proclaim it clearly. You know, I, we just talked about the work of the Holy Spirit in the first century in the establishment of the church and how a person is baptized into Christ to receive the gift of the Spirit. And it says here he wants to be able to speak clearly. Uh, we, we do study with the idea of you know, we want to be able to just go point out the scriptures to people and to be clear on what the scriptures teach. We don't want to be confusing and cause confusion uh, with others that were with the brotherhood, with a class like this, or with someone that's not a Christian. We want to speak it clearly. We're going to run out of time here, but uh, let's see. Let me read one that's from 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1. And now, brothers, pray for us. Pray that the Lord's teaching will continue to spread quickly and pray that people will give honor to that teaching. Some won't. Some won't give honor to the teaching of Christ. Some reject it uh, and some will accept it. We don't know who will accept it and who will reject it. And we don't know, but what, haven't you heard stories or maybe you've had relatives? They heard it for 20 years and then finally decided to obey the gospel. You know, we don't know how it's going to affect people, but our responsibility is to live it and then, uh, you know, do our best to teach it to others. Talk to God about men before you talk to men about God. That's prayer, isn't it? That's a quote from a man named Bill Wright. Talk to God about men before you talk to men about God. Romans 10, verse 1. I'm skipping some here. Uh, we may not get every verse in. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites. That's his, his brethren, his fellow Israelites. 
Paul's Israelites, is that they may be saved. Well, that was his prayer for the Israelites. I'm sure that's your prayer for your, your relatives. That's my prayer for my relatives. We want their salvation. Would someone find Philemon, that one chapter book, Philemon, and read verses four through seven? It's about sharing faith. Philemon four through seven. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Deepen your understanding, sharing your faith, prayers, the word pray, and he says, I thank my God as I remember you. So we have a lot to be thankful to God for. Question, what keeps me from praying? This is in the outline, so I have to ask it. What keeps me from praying? Anybody? I don't schedule it in my calendar. If I schedule it, I do it. Well, that's a good point. You know, I, I thought of the book of Daniel when you said that. You know, he got in trouble. His, his political enemies got him in trouble about praying. But it was his habit to go open that window. And for him, he would look toward Jerusalem, I think it was three times a day. And it was a regular habit, a good habit, and go pray. So schedule our time and pray. Anyone else? Next question. What needs to change in my life so prayer can become more natural? Well, schedule your time. That's a good one. I put spend time in the Word. Do you find it easier to pray if you're thinking about God? Maybe you're not even, you don't even have the Bible open, but you think of the Bible and different teachings of the Bible. Doesn't it make it easier in your mind to pray? Uh, does anybody pray while you're driving down the road? Yeah. Okay. You have to pray when you're driving out of the road. Yeah. In love. Yeah. Okay. So we want to grow, as that last passage said, in our understanding of Christ, in our knowledge of Him, and we want to grow and improve in our prayer life. And we're about out of time. I, I printed off something that it doesn't even have any scriptures on it, but I'm going to give it to you as a handout here. Because it uh, it goes, it's that topic of empowering of the Spirit, laying on of the apostles' hands, uh, and being baptized into Christ, the indwelling of the Spirit. For you to take a look at as you study through uh, the book of Acts, and by the time we get to chapter 19, maybe this will be helpful. If, if, if anybody gets one with writing on the back, give it back because that's my research and I don't want to redo it. I think I kept that up this year. All right. Great. Would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your son. We ask that you be with us and guide us and help us to always look to you for answers. Dear Lord, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.